Hello, in this presentation we will take a look at merchandising transactions. At the end of this presentation we will be able to record transactions related to buying inventory, record transactions related to selling inventory, record, calculate and record sales discount, calculate and record purchase discount, explain the effect on the trial balance from transactions listed above. So what we're going to do in this, this lecture is Take a look at the differences from the service company to the merchandising company in terms of recording entries. So we're going to look at the main differences between those two transaction types. We're not going to look at the things that are basically the same because, of course, they will be the same. So the transactions from a service company that we have looked at prior, which are the day-to-day -day transactions, paying the utility bills, recording the daily transactions, will be the same. Accounting concept, the same the idea of a balancing uh, financial statements in terms of the balance sheet and how the balance sheet relates to the income statement and the statement of owner's equity will be the same. We will have an adjusting process. We will have a closing process. What will differ? Buying and selling inventory because now that is the new transaction. Those are the types of things we'll take a look at in this presentation. So we're going to start just listing out some of the common transactions and we're going to look at some terminology as we go through these transactions. So in this case, we're going to purchase merchandise from B. So we are the purchaser. Remember, we're buying and selling merchandise. We're pur purchasing merchandise from company B. And then we're going to talk about these terms of the discount. So company B is going to give us a discount. Now, when we think about discounts, we have a lot of things come to mind, usually sales discounts in terms of a sale in order to help uh, sell the inventory in order to increase sales. The discount in this case mainly is really to help us to pay on time. So we're thinking about the time value of money. We're thinking about turning over the receivables. So if we're purchasing from another company, they are giving us a discount in this term generally so that we pay earlier. And in so doing, they're going to get their cash earlier, feel more secure about the transaction. And because of the time value of money, they would rather get the money sooner rather than later. All right, so if we look at the transaction information, this is before the transaction happened. I'm going to give you some very simple information so that we can look at the transaction, look at the effect on uh, the trial balance, the accounting equation, as well as subsidiary ledgers. So if we look at the accounting equation at this time, we have assets of 30000 in terms of cash and inventory at this point. We have liabilities of zero. I'm going to take those out completely. And then we have owner's equity being the thirty just represented by the capital count at this time. So the assets equal the liabilities plus the owner's equity. The debits in this case are being represented by non-brackets or positive numbers as the way Excel sees them. Excel sees negative numbers or bracketed numbers here. So the debits minus the credits mean that we are in balance here. We're in balance in our accounting equation here. That's represented by the green zeros, meaning the debits equal the credits. Net income, there is no net income at this time. That would be the sales less the expenses and the sales allowance and discounts, which we'll talk about at this time. So this is a very simplified set of accounts, but we want to see these in context of a trial balance in context of a balancing system. Then we're going to have the receivable subsidiary ledger and the payable subsidiary ledger. What do these do? They back up the receivable account and the payable account. And of course, you might be saying, well, doesn't the general ledger back up the account? It backs up every account has a general ledger account. And yes, the receivable account and the payable account do have a general ledger account as well. But the uh, general ledger backs it up in terms of date. So if I want to see more detail about any of these accounts, such as cash, I can look at the general ledger and see the activity by date in the general ledger that will add up to the 25000 We'll also have that type of general ledger for the receivables and the payables. However, we really want to see it by customer and vendor, respectively, between the receivable and the payable, meaning if someone owes us money, we want to know who, and so that we can collect. If we owe someone else money, we want to know who. Therefore, we're going to break it out by vendor. In this case, we have very generic names, uh, company C, A, B, and L. So in this case, we purchased merchandise and the terms 2 slash 15 and 30. What does that mean? Well, anytime you see a format like this, the number before the slash, the first number is going to be the number of the discount. That's going to be 2 or 2%. 2 so we read that as 2% in terms of this terminology slash 15. 15 means 15 days. So 15, that 15 means 15 days in this format. 
comma, in basically otherwise, if you do not pay within 15 days within the discounted period, then you pay within 30 days. And that's kind of like the normal pay period. So if we're doing a normal transaction with a vendor, it's often expected that the payment will be received within 30 days. And that's just the normal transaction. If it's not paid within 30 days, then further collection action might happen, including, you know, advance notices, maybe, maybe if there's penalties within the term, and maybe even a collection action outside, like going to another collection agent to try to collect on uh, the debt. The cost of the inventory to us, the amount that we are going to pay eventually uh, and at a later date because we're buying it on account, is $6,500. So we're, we're buying it now, we're getting the inventory, and then we're going to pay the uh, $6,500 at the future time period. So the accounts that will be affected, we're going to go through our transaction types. Is cash affected? No, because we bought it on terms of credit terms. Therefore, the account that will be affected is accounts payable. Now, remember that accounts payable is a liability, and oftentimes people have more trouble determining whether the liability should be a debit or a credit. So a lot of times I like to think about what we get. We are receiving inventory. We can see that the inventory is an asset. It's green in the asset area next to the other assets. We can see it has a debit balance represented by the fact that it does not have brackets around it, and we need to make it go up because we're buying more of it. How do we make something go up? We do the same thing to it, which in this case would be another debit. So we're going to debit inventory. We're going to have to do something to another account. That other account would be cash if we paid cash, but we bought it on account represented by the terms. Therefore, we're going to credit the liability. So the accounts payable, as we said before, will be the liability similar to a credit card. And it has a credit balance. Liabilities all have credit balances for the most part. They are going to go up or anything goes up by doing the same thing to it. So therefore, the credit will increase the liability in the credit direction. We're also going to re record the fact that we owe B money over here in terms of the payable account. So let's see what that looks like. We're going to have the transaction here. We debit the merchandise inventory. We credit the accounts payable like so. If we take a look at the posting of that, then we're going to show that post, that journal entry right here. Here's the debit. Here's the credit. Debit minus the credit still equals zero. What happens in terms of our trial balance? Cash went from 5000 up. In the debit direction account, debit, debit makes the debit go up to 11.5. And then we have uh, the accounts payable going from zero up in the credit direction, credit represented by brackets. Again, Excel sees that as a negative number. We see it as an increase in the credit direction when we're talking about debits and credits to 6.5 in this case. That 6.5 will be backed up by the general ledger in order of date, but it's also backed up down here in terms of the accounts payable uh, general ledger showing that we owe this company, company B, 6.5, and that ties out all the companies then tie out to what is on our trial balance. So then the next transaction, of course, is we can sell something. So we sold merchandise to C company, terms 2.10 and 60. Uh, sales price 1,000, cost 542. Uh, this is the obviously the same transaction, but now we're the seller instead of the purchaser. We bought the inventory. Now we are now selling the inventory. We have a, a similar terms. We have the same term that we saw last time, but we have to realize the fact that we are now the seller, not the purchaser. So now when we sell to someone else, the term means we are going to give a 2% discount if the person we sell to pays us within the 10 days. Otherwise, they're going to pay us within 60 days. So we have a bit of a longer uh, term here. We're going to allow 60 days on the normal time period uh, but if they pay us within 10 days, we'll give them a 2% discount. Notice both of these transactions, we're kind of assuming that the payment will not happen within the time period, and we're putting it on the books at the full price, not the price after the discount. So really, we're not going to worry about this discount until we um, receive payment in this case, and in the prior journal entry, we're not worrying about the 2% discount until we pay the money, if we pay it within the time period. Now, of course, since we sell merchandise inventory, we have both a sales price and we, what we have what we bought it for. And so we have to keep that in mind. We've got those two transactions that we're going to have to make. So we have the same information. We got the assets and we're recording the assets after that last transaction now. So now we've got the 25 plus the 11.5 in the assets, bringing the assets to 36.5. We have this liability now of the 6.5 liability. We have the capital account of the 30,000, nothing on the income statement. 
our debits equal the credits, so therefore we are in balance. There's two transactions related to us selling inventory. One is very similar to the service company. The first half is very similar to the service company. We want to break out the half that's similar to the service company and the half that's related to the inventory in the two transactions, or that's what I believe is the easiest way to think about this. So if we sold something on a service account, as we did prior, and, and we sold it on account, the question is, is cash affected? And the answer is no, we sold it on account. We know that by the terms. Therefore, what did we get? We got accounts receivable in this case. We got an IOU. We can see that the IOU is in the debit section, and we know that it needs to go up because people owe us more money. How do we make something go up? We do the same thing to it, which in this case would be a debit. We're going to debit the AR. We need to increase this account. We also know that the related account to AR, if we didn't have anything to do with inventory, just like a service company, if we just did work and earned money, the credit is going to sales in this case. We earned it or revenue or income. We called it, we could have called it fees earned in a service company, but it's just the income account. So the income account is below the equity section, which is blue here. We're going to call it sales if we sell inventory. So sales always has a credit balance. We need to make it go up. How do we make something go up? We do the same thing to it, which in this case is another credit. So that journal entry is pretty much the same as it would be for a service company. So keep that in mind. Break that out between the, in, between the sales half and the inventory half. The other thing that happens, the new thing that happens, is we sold, of course, inventory. We had to give up inventory in order to help us generate that revenue. Inventory has a debit balance. We need to make it go down because we sold it. Therefore, we're going to do the opposite thing to it. So we're going to have to make this amount go down by the cost, not the sales price. And the other half of that will be a form of expense. Why? Because we consumed an asset in order to help us generate revenue in the same period. That's the definition of expense. It doesn't have the word expense in it. It's going to be called cost of goods sold. But that is our most important expense. Expenses have debit balances. They're going to go up by doing the same thing to it, which in this case would be a debit of the 542. So let's take a look at that and see what it looks like here. Here's the journal entry. Uh, 1,000 debit and... Uh, 1,000 credit to sale. And then let's record that one first, and then we'll talk about the inventory. So the sales item, we're going to say, is going to go up to accounts receivable. So it's, accounts receivable is zero. It went up by the 1,000 to 1,000. And then the sales side down here is under sales. Remember, that's similar to fees earned. It's income. It's revenue. Went from zero up in the credit direction to 1,000. And that's going to bring the net income up by the 1,000. But there's a second half to this, of course, and that's going to be the cost of goods sold and the inventory. So remember, the inventory now needs to go down by the cost of the stuff that we bought. So here's the inventory. It's going to go down with a credit represented by brackets to the new inventory. So the 11.5 minus the 5.42 gives us the 10.958. And the expense related to that then would be the cost of goods sold. So the cost of goods sold goes from zero up in the debit direction because it is an expense by the 542 to 542. What's the effect on the net income then? It's the 1000 sales price. And remember, that's what you see really when you go into the store and you look at the sticker. It says this thing is 1000, right? Uh, what you do not see is, of course, the cost. The cost, if we have a perpetual system such as in a grocery store, does record the cost, but we, the consumer, do not see that. So we see the sales price minus the cost means that they really the net income is the 458. Remember that's income not a loss because the income has a credit in this case minus the debit 458. Also note that we have the 1000 here. We want to back that up. We do want to back it up by the general ledger, which we do, but we also want to back it up by who owes us money. We're going to call that the subsidiary ledger. So in this case, who owes us the money? C company owes us the money. So we're going to track and see when C company pays us and then reduce that amount when that happens. Okay, so then we got the idea of what happens when we pay cash for the freight on the purchase of the inventory. Now, this, the freight of the inventory, when we buy the inventory, could be paid by us or it could be paid by the seller. And when we think of the freight, we could think of the first half of the journal entry if we paid for something. The question is, is cash affected? And of course it is. We paid the cash. We paid it with cash. Cash has a debit balance. We're going to make it go down by doing the opposite thing to it, which in this case would be a credit. So we're going to credit cash and we would debit something. 
you might think that we would debit the freight expense or some kind of shipping expense or postage maybe or something like that. Uh, but in this case, we paid the freight to in order to get that inventory to us. So uh, the freight in this case is part of the inventory cost. If we are buying something from China and we're paying for the shipment for it to get here, then we really need to put that as part of the, of the inventory cost because we couldn't get the inventory without the payment of the freight. So in this case, we need to put that into the asset. The debit will be going into inventory. So the journal entry will look like this. We got the debit to the inventory for the freight that we paid, credit to cash. So cash has 25, it's a debit. We're gonna make it go down by doing the opposite thing to it, bringing the amount down. Instead of expensing this amount, we're including it in the inventory. So beginning inventory plus uh, the cost of the freight to get it to us gives us ending of 1168. Um, no effect on net income accounts here. Net income remains unchanged at that point. Next transaction, we're going to say we received the balance due from C company within the discount period of 210 and 60 sales price 1000. So now we got the money from C company and they paid us within the discount period. What does that mean? They paid us within the 10 days, not the 60 days. So now when they pay us, the, the idea is that we're going to have to account for the discount now. So we put them on the books and you can see it here for the 1000 to C company. They owe us 1000. They're not going to pay us 1000 because they paid us within the discount period. So there's a couple ways we can think about it. We're going to think maybe is cash affected? That's what we usually ask. And we're going to say, yeah, it is affected and it's going to go up because we got more of it. Cash has a debit uh, balance, it's going to go up, so we're going to debit it, but we're not going to debit it by the amount owed to us because we're not going to get that. We're going to give them a 2% discount because it was paid within 10 days. So how do we calculate that? We're going to say, well, we could say 1,000 times 0.02% would give us a discount of 20 minus 1,000 means we're going to receive a 980. But also note that if we say 100% is 1 minus... Uh, the 2%, 0.02, if we're not getting 2%, how much are we getting? 98%. If you go to a, a store and you're trying to calculate discounts a little bit quicker, you might want to think of it this way. You say, well, if there's a 2% sale or discount, in this case, the amount that of money will then be 98% times, in this case, the 1,000. And that might be a faster way to kind of get to that number. So we're going to receive 980 from that. So we're going to debit the cash for the 980 we're going to credit something normally we would credit of course receivable meaning we need to take the receivable off the books they owe us a thousand that needs to go away just remember that we're going to credit it for the entire amount the 1000 not the amount of cash we got which is only 980 if we credit it for 980 we would be left with 20 dollars showing that they owe us 20 but they don't they owe they don't owe us anything therefore we got to credit the full thousand the difference will be the discount and in this case, it will be a sales discount. So let's see what that looks like. Here's the transaction. Now, you'll note that I put it a little bit out of order. I could, I should have put the two debits on top in some cases, but I just want to show you that it does work the same way if you do not have the two debits on top. If you want to move the two debits on top, that is okay. If you're thinking through the transaction in terms of the way I would think through the transaction, it is that cash would be affected first, and I would think about what happens to cash as we did. It's going to go up by the 980. So here's cash going up. If we were to post that debit and the debit makes it go up, then I would think about what happens to the receivable. It's going to go down by the thousand. So here's the credit to the thousand makes the cash, the receivable is a debit. The opposite makes it go down to zero. We also see that in the subsidiary ledger and that brings the receivable down to match the trial balance. And then the difference I would call the plug. You can calculate it two different ways. You can take the 1000 times 2% or you can say well uh, 980 plus what will equal the 1000 I need the debits to equal the credits and that's why I put it in this format that's the order in which I would build the journal entry to help me post the journal entry if you want to then move the two debits on top that's fine so the the sales discount will be here note that when we think about the sales discount we might be saying well why didn't we reduce sales and the reason for that is you can see here that the sales is $1,000 because we originally put it on the books at 1000 When we got the money, we only got 980 So we really overstated sales. This sales number is overstated. Why don't we debit the sales, bringing the sales down to the proper amount of 980 Answer being that we don't generally debit sales. We generally 
only have sales go up. Therefore, we're going to make this account that acts like an expense being sales discount, meaning it has a debit balance. It brings net income down, as you can see here. Uh, and it's really going to be it's, it's like an expense, but when we put it on the income statement, it'll be in the sales section. So similar to accumulated depreciation being a contra asset, this is somewhat like a contra sales account, meaning it's going to act like an expense. But what when we put it on the income statement, it's going to be a reduction basically to the sales amount, bringing us to net sales, which is different from net income. All right, next transaction, we're going to say paid balance due to B company within the discount period of 2 slash 15 in 30. Uh, purchase price was 6005 So now we are the one paying uh, the purchaser, and we got the discount, and we paid within the discount period, discount period being 15 days. Therefore, we get a 2% discount. So we're going to get a 2% discount on the 65 that we paid. So in this case, once again, is cash affected? Yeah, in this case, we paid cash. Cash has a debit balance. We need to make it go down. But it's not going to go down by the 6.5 because we got a 2% discount. How could we calculate that discount? Well, we could take the 6.5 times 2%, 0.02. There's the discount minus the original number that we owed, 6.5, means we're going to pay 6.370. Could we do that with one calculation or less of a calculation? Yeah, because we know that if 100 is 1 minus 2% discount, 0.02, that means we're going to pay, in this case, 98%. So you can just think, okay, 98%, we got a 2% discount. Uh, we're going to pay 98% of times uh, the 6.5. And that'll bring the same number. So we're going to credit reduce the cash by the uh, 637 the zero then of course we're paying off who are we paying off we're paying off b here we're paying off the payable there's only one person in there if there's more than one payable then we'd have to go to the subsidiary ledger and say okay we owe b uh six five so we're gonna have to debit something in order to make this go down and what are we going to debit well we're not going to debit the amount that we paid we're going to debit the amount that we owe why because if we debit the amount we paid we would still show on our books that we owe them the difference the discount and we don't therefore we need to take off the entire six five and the difference the confusing thing is that we got the discount this time so oftentimes people are going to say well there should be a discount type account here for the discount that we received but just remember this is the sales discount that represents discounts that we give to our customers this does not represent discounts that are given to us by our vendors. So wh where do we put the difference then? It's going to go to inventory. And why will it go to inventory? Because really we overstated inventory. We put inventory on the books at 6.5. But after the discount, we didn't pay 6.5. We paid something other than 6.5. We paid something less than 6.5. Therefore, we need to reduce the amount of the inventory on the books to the amount we paid. So let's take a look at that and see what that looks like. Here's what the journal entry is going to look like. And so account, we know that the cash went down. It went down by the amount we paid. We paid 6,500 6, times 98% because it's 100% minus 2%. So the cash is going to go down to the 19.5. We are going to uh, debit the payable because the payable has a credit balance. We need to make it go down by doing the opposite thing to it, which in this case would be a debit of 6.5, not 6,370 that we paid because we owe 6.5 and if we did not debit the 6.5 we would show that we still owe the discount of 130 which we would do not so we have to take it all the way off the books then the difference could be calculated two ways could be the 6.5 times the discount for the 130 or we have a debit of 6.5 minus a credit of 6.370 the plug then is 130 that 130 is the discount we received there is no account for the called discount for the discount we receive because this is a sales discount for the discounts we give what we need to do is reduce the inventory by the overstatement that we put on the books when we purchased it we purchased the inventory for 65 we only paid 6370 we need to reduce the merchandise by the 130 to uh, 10938 Okay, so we are now able to record transactions related to buying inventory, record transactions related to selling inventory, calculate and record sales discount, 
calculate and record purchase discount as well as explain the effect on the trial balance from transactions listed above.